Hey guys, so this is the NCLEX RN 2019 ATI Comprehensive Review. So this is part 4B. This is on pharmacology. It's a continuation from 4A. So here are just a list of respiratory medication classes that we're going to be going over. They could treat all different stuff like asthma, bronchitis, emphysema, etc. So now we're going to go into each of these categories and list the medications and the side effects. So here are general instructions for respiratory medications. Okay, so first of all, you can take beta-2 before inhaled steroids. The reason for this is because you want to increase the steroid absorption. For inhalant drugs, which a lot of them are because they're respiratory, you want to remove the mouthpiece, you want to shake the container, you want the patient to be standing upright or sitting upright, and exhale completely. Then you want to place the mouthpiece between the teeth and close the lips tightly around it. You want to breathe in and press down the inhaler, hold the breath for like 10 to 15 seconds, and breathe out normally. Beta 2 adrenergic agonist. So I would just remember beta 2 and like we said in the previous video beta 1 is for heart because we have one heart and beta 2 is for lungs because we have two lungs. So basically what it does is that it promotes bronchodilation by activating the beta receptors in the bronchial smooth muscle. Okay so the three drugs I would remember is albuterol which is short acting, salmetrol which is long acting, and terbutalin which is long acting. A way to remember that the only one that's not inhaled is terbutalin is because it doesn't end in all like the other ones do. And just for your reference, short acting would be more like 5 to 10 minutes and long acting would be like 10 hours. The contraindications would be someone with tachydysrhythmia. Some side effects are tachycardia, palpitations, and tremors. So for this slide, I would remember the names of the medication and that they speed up everything so you have tachycardia, palpitations, as side effects. Methylxanthines. So they relax the bronchial smooth muscle by causing bronchodilation. This class includes aminophilin and theophylline. Some contraindications are active peptic ulcers. It also it interferes with phentoin and phenobarbital. Some side effects are irritability and restlessness. Toxic effects it cause tachycardia, tachypnea, and seizures. Other things to know, you should avoid caffeine, smoking, and alcohol. In general, you should avoid that with most of the medications. If it's at a toxic level, you want to stop the infusion and give active charcoal and treat the symptom. Inhaled anticholinergic. These are muscarinic receptor blockers that causes bronchodilation. Medications in this class include ipotropium and teotropium. So they both end in tropium. You should not be using this for bronchospasms, only to prevent it. This is contraindicated with patients with peanut allergies, BPH, narrow angle glaucoma. Some side effects is dry mouth, dry eyes, and urinary tension. There are other side effects because it's an anticholinergic. So you should just know all the anticholinergic side effects because there's a lot of medications that fall under anticholinergic. A mnemonic to remember this is can't see, which goes to blurred vision, can't pee, which is urinary tension, can't spit, which is dry mouth, and can't shit, which is constipation. I would know these side effects because you're going to get a select alert apply that includes anticholinergic, and automatically when you see it, it should just ring a bell and you should think can't see, can't pee, etc. One last point, you should tell the patient that it could take up to two weeks to see the full effect. They should shake the inhaler before, and if they're using two different medications, they should wait five minutes between each one. Glucocorticoids. So they prevent the inflammatory response by suppressing the airway mucus production, immune response, and adrenal function. They can be given orally, inhaled, IV. So medications that you should know is prednisone, bethamethasone, fluticasone, tricinolone, methylprednisolone. So basically, they all end in own or alone. A hint to remember is that glucocorticoids have a lot of C's in them. So what's the opposite of a lot? is one, so own one. This is, is for short term, for status asthmatic, acute asthma attack, for long term, for prophylactic of asthma and chronic asthma. Some side effects, the easiest way to remember this is to think of the Cushing syndrome, which is too much steroids. What happens is the same exact side effects as glucocorticoids with hypoglycemia, increased appetite, withdrawal symptoms, fluid retention, peptic ulcer, insomnia, euphoria, and psychotic behavior. Just a side note, I would remember all the Cushing syndrome side effects because you're going to have to know. Some other things you should know is that you never want to stop it abruptly. You want to give it with meals and you do not want to take it with NSAIDs. Leukotriene modifiers. What they do is that they prevent leukotriene. So what this causes is decreased bronchoconstriction, airway edema, and mucus production. So it just decreases all that. The medications, I would just know Monte Leucoset. And you should just know that this is for long-term maintenance of asthma. It is not for an asthma attack. Antitusive, expectorants, and mucolytics. Okay, antitusives, they suppress cough. Examples are hydrocodone and codeine, which also are opioids, so they have a potential for abuse. But expectorants, which they promote increased mucus secretions to increase the cough production. This includes glufenazine 
And then the last one is mucolytics. They enhance the flow of secretions in the respiratory tract. And examples are acetylcysteine and hypertonic saline. They could be used for, let's say, cystic fibrosis and stuff that you need to get out the secretion. Some side effects include drowsiness, dizziness, aspiration, bronchospasm, and constipation. Other interventions, you want to promote fluid intake, you want to monitor secretions, like how much and the character of it. You want to monitor the cough, the effort, how much it is, etc. And you want to auscultate for adventitious lung sounds. Decongestants and antihistamines. So decongestants, they stimulate the alpha-1 adrenergic receptors. They cause reduced inflammation of nasal membranes. So they're used for colds, rhinitis, sinitis. So some drugs include phenylephrine, pseudoephedrine, nafilazine. So I would just know phenylephrine. Um, antihistamines, these I would know. They decrease allergic response by competing for the histamine receptor site. They're used for hypersensitivity reactions, and some medications include diphenylhydramine, loratadine, cetirizine, vexophenidine. Some side effects are the anticholinergic, like we said before. So you have to memorize those. Um, some other stuff you should know is that you should take it at night, monitor the blood pressure, and assess for hypokalemia and no alcohol. You should just know that children may have other signs and symptoms like excitability, hallucinations, and seizures. So now we're going to go into endocrine medications. Here is a list of some classes that we're about to go into. Oral hypoglycemics. So as you can see, there's a lot of them and there's a lot of classes which they fall under. So I'm not going to go over all of them that are listed here. I'm just going to go over the main ones that you're going to keep seeing over and over. So I bolded them a little bit and they're underlined. The first class is biquanidine. So this one is metformin. So metformin, you should know you should withhold that 48 hours before and 48 hours after a test with contra. So anything with iodine. It's contraindicated with patients with severe infection, shock, and hypoxic condition. Another class you should know is the sulfonylureas. This includes the lipizide and bimuteride. This one has a high, high risk for hypoglycemia. And you just know that disulfiram-like reaction occur with alcohol. So do not take this with alcohol. And you should know with all these that it's important to include the healthy diet and the exercise. And you have to monitor the hemoglobin A1c, which is, shows you the glucose for the past three months. So basically, all these medications, they stimulate insulin release. So you can just be familiar with the names. And these are oral hypoglycemics. I wouldn't go into detail. Okay, insulin. This you should know. This this could be used with all different type of diabetics, like gestational diabetes, um, diabetes one, diabetes two. It could be used with an oral hypoglycemic for specific conditions, like in pregnancy, with liver disease, etc. Some side effects are hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia and lipodystrophy, which is there's missing fat somewhere. Something you should know when you're mixing insulin, you should know RN. Just think of the hint RN, regular for R before N, which is NPH. Never mix it with a long acting like Lispro or Bargain. And the regular one is the only one that could be given IV. You should roll the vial, but not the regular one to mix it, but do not shake it. The gargling should be taken at it. So here are the insulins. I would know this whole chart. As you see, the insulins have different onset, peak, durations. You're gonna have to know all that. And no, you do not have to know the trade name, but you're going to have to know like under type. And you also have to know if the rapid, short acting, intermediate, or long acting. I would just take a picture of this and memorize this. Glycemic agents, so what they do is that they promote the breakdown of glycogen to glucose in the liver. So basically it increases the glucose serum level. The medication in this one is glucagon. You should know this also. It's given for severe hypoglycemia for someone who is unresponsive. Because if someone was responsive and they were hypoglycemic, you would give them 15 grams of glucose. So usually they just give them orange juice, but the glucagon would be given if they're unresponsive. Some side effects are nausea, vomiting, and rebound hypoglycemia. Thyroid hormone. So the medication in this class is levothyroxine. You probably heard of it. It's called Synthroid T4. So it's used for hypothyroidism, my eczema coma. So it stimulates the metabolism. So if you have too much, you're going to have hyperthyroidism signs. So which is the side effects, which is tachycardia, restlessness, diarrhea, weight loss, decreased bone density, heat intolerance, and insomnia. It's like all the side effects of speeding things up, like your heart races, you get restless. Intervention, you want to monitor the cardiac, you want to start out with a low dose and then increase when needed. You want to monitor the T4 and TSH levels, and you want to take in the morning without any food. Thyroid hormone antagonist. So this medication, it stops the thyroid hormone, or slows it down. So this is methimazole. So it's used for hypothyroidism, for pre-op, thyroidectomy for thyrotoxic crisis and for thyroid storm. 
you should discontinue it before radioactive iodine uptake testing. It's contraindicated in breastfeeding, bone marrow depression, hepatic disease, and bleeding disorder. So the side effects are skin rash, itching, abnormal hair loss, GI, paresthesia, periorbital edema, muscle pain, jaundice, agranial cytosis, and thrombocytopenia. Um, you should give it with food the same time every day and increase the fluids to 3 liters and avoid iodine products. Anterior pituitary, which is the growth hormone, it increases the production of insulin-like growth hormone. So the medication in this class is somatropian. It's used for deficiency in growth hormone or Turner syndrome. It's contraindicated if someone has severe obesity and glucocorticoids. Some side effects are hyperglycemia and hypothyroidism. A hint to remember the medication is that soma is the body, so growing the growth hormone. Anterior pituitary hormone, which is antidiuretic hormone. So it helps the reabsorption of water in the kidney, which vasoconstricts. The medication in this group are desmopressin, which is abbreviated DDVAP. I would know this, or vasopressin. Um, its uses are for, for diabetes encephalitis, cardiac arrest, nocturnal aneurysis, or hemophilia. It's contraindicated in patients with chronic hepatitis or patients who are at high risk for myocardial infarction. Some side effects are hyponatremia, seizures, and coma. Um, interventions, you want to monitor the specific gravity, the blood pressure, and the urinary output. Adrenal hormone replacement is an anti-inflammatory and suppresses the immune response. Medications in this category is dexamethasone, hydrocortisone, and prednisone. As you can see, they all end in owns because they're steroids. Um, some uses are to replace adrenal cortical insufficiency like Addison's disease. Some other stuff you should know is that you need a higher dose in times of stress or illness. Some side effects are infections, hyperglycemia, osteoporosis, GI bleed, and fluid retention. Hematologic medications, here are the classes that we're about to go into. Blood. So this includes whole blood, packed red blood cells, platelet concentration. Um, so intervention. So they like to test on blood. So first of all, so you're going to go to the patient, you're going to ask the ID, the name, and, the, and you're going to match the blood type. And you're going to verify this with two nurses. Then you're going to assess the baseline vitals, which includes the temperature, and you're going to establish an IV axis with 18 to 20 gauge needle. And you must have sodium chloride primed in a different tubing. And for the first 15 minutes after you give it, you have to stay with the patient and infuse it slowly. You want to complete the infusion within four hours from when you got the blood. Some side effects are hypovolemia, sepsis, and febrile. And you just know if a reaction does occur, you want to stop it immediately, take the vials, infuse 0.9 sodium chloride, tell the healthcare provider, and follow the facility protocols. Hematopoietic growth factors. So there's different categories. The epitoin alpha, they stimulate the red blood cells productions, and the side effect is hypertension. The filgrastin, it stimulates white blood cells, and side effects is bone pain and leukocytosis. And the last one is oprelvicin, which stimulates platelets. And the side effects are cardiac side effects, blurred vision, and fluid retention. Iron preparations. Iron can be given orally and parentally. So orally, you're going to see ferrous um, sulfite, ferrous gluconite. Just remember the word ferrous is iron, and then whatever ends it is going to be iron. Um, you want to avoid contact with the teeth, so you want to use it with juice or a straw or a syringe. You want to take it with orange juice and vitamin C. You want to avoid antacids, coffee, tea, dairy, whole grain bread because they decrease the absorption. So you can eat them, just not with it. And the major side effect for iron is constipation. The parental form is called iron dextran. It could be IM or IV. For the IM, you want to use a large bone IV, z track and don't massage, and never in the deltoid muscle. For IV, you want to first test a small dose, and you want to watch for 15 minutes after. Anticoagulants. So what they do is that they stop the clotting. Some examples are warfarin, dabigatrin, riboboxin, and heparin. You should note this whole slide. So with these, they're used for strokes, myocardial infarctions, DVTs, DIC, cardiac cath, and pulmonary embolism. Want to avoid NSAIDs, aspirin, ginger, ginkgo, and ginseng because then you have an increased risk of bleeding. Some side effects are bleeding, like we said, hemorrhage. Um, heparin-induced cytopenia, and toxicity. So this you should know. 
For warfarin, you want to monitor the PT and INR. And for heparin, you want to monitor the APTT. And for heparin, if you're at a toxic dose, you want to give the antidote with protamine sulfate. And also, you should know for heparin, you want to go in the stomach, the abdominal. You want to go two inches from the umbilicus. You want to rotate the sites. And remember to wear a med alert bracelet and bleeding precautions and no alcohol. Okay, and the platelets, they're a little bit like anticoagulants. They stop the platelets from clumping together, which basically prevents clots and DVTs and all those stuff that we said before. So the medications are aspirin, epsigmine, I don't know how to pronounce that, clopidogrel, diclofene, and diparidamol. Contraindications are th thrombocytopenia and peptic ulcer. Some side effects are bleeding and then thrombocytopenia. Um, you want to report tarry stools, ecchymosis, papilla, all the stuff that can indicate bleeding. Thrombolytics. These do, they dissolve a clot. So the ones that we said before, the anticoagulants and antiplatelets, they prevent clots from forming, but they don't dissolve it. This is if you already have a clot, then you're prescribed a thrombolytics. So these are important. Some medications are out of place and all of them that end in place. And to remember this, that it's already in its place. The clot is already in its place. You're not preventing it. Contraindications, so these you have to know. These are test on law, intracranial hemorrhage, active bleeding, aortic dissection, brain tumors, and severe hypertension. Some side effects are bleeding and hypotension. Something else you have to know is that it has to be given within 48 hours of the symptom onset. So not when the patient came to the ER, it's from when they actually had the symptom. So stay tuned for part 4C in which I will continue the pharmacology and you could subscribe and like for more videos.